We will start the uh, <coughs> meeting of the Health, Mental Health, and Education Committee. And today is April 24th, 10.33 a.m. Um, and uh, we have a quorum today. Um, I'm joined by Council Member Joe Buscaino. And I just want to remind anybody in the audience that um, if you want to speak on any of the items today or on uh, the agenda, I want any of the items on the agenda or for public comment, please fill out a comment card and please give it up to the front. And um, you must fill out your own card. So at this point, I'm going to have uh, Mr. Wayne Spindler come up and I'll give you a total of three minutes um, for your items number one, two, and three and public comment. Buscaino, you have fur on your face. Okay. Let's see here. Item one, the criminal city attorney through the criminal city administrative officer <coughs> and other criminal city departments to develop food procurement policies and practices to ensure the availability of Healthy food options at city facilities. Well, what the fuck kind of foods are these? Vegetables, salads, fruits? No! We want to eat potato chips, candy bars, Red Bull, except not made with bull products because I'm a bull, and other types of treats. We do not want to eat this healthy so-called shit. We do not like it. I'm a puppet. I eat candy bars. I drink sodas. Look how healthy I look compared to these two sickly looking people here that supposedly eat healthy. It's all in the mind. The mind controls the body. Thinking young means you're young. If you think old like these two, you will be old before the age of 45. Yes. Now we get to number two, the women's health relative publication. Yes, I've read this. Do not allow Nuri Martinez to involve herself in this because she's been acting like a bitch and she's been hiring pimps in her district office Pimping and prostituting all over CD6. I have photos. Nuri Martinez is a pimp. And do not allow her in the Women's Health County Health Indicator. And then we have the elder abuse reporting. Oh, yes, I know. Current Price is being abused by his second wife. Probably she kicked the shit out of him for being a bigamist. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, 67 years old. He's a player. Please, please, um, He's a player. Stick to the topics. Like yes, that. you want to defend him, Mr. Wu. You've turned to the dark side of the force of politics. Remember when you used to be on our side? Mr. Spindler, if you could focus on the, uh, the items in public comment pertaining to the health, mental health. Yes, education. remember when you used to care about the health of Cape Town? Remember when you fought against the... Districting. Remember what the little shirt you wore? No, look at you. He's got a topic. Yes, but you have fur and you're an animal. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, seeing no other public comment, public comment is closed. Um, if we go to agenda item number one, uh, Mr. CLA, if you could read number one. Item number one is motion by council members Weezar and Krikorian relative to instructing the chief legislative analyst with the assistance of the city attorney, the city administrative officer, and other city departments as may be necessary to develop food procurement policies and practices in order to ensure the availability of healthy food options at city facilities. Thank you, Ms. Shelley. Is that music playing? I think it's outside. Oh, it's Grand Park. Okay, I thought it was maybe our speaker system. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. This motion was request of a council member who is to have city staff research introducing healthier food options at city facilities and vending machines. Um, I think this pertains to all of us, and this is something of uh, very much interest. I just have a quick question, if I, if, if I could just ask the CLA, um, not to put you on the spot because I know the report's going to come back, but uh, ha what has staff learned so far about how we procure food at city facilities and vending machines? 
Good morning. I'm Brian Randall, Office of the CLA. Um, we've reached out to several departments regarding the motion. Um, the personnel department has advised that their new city employee wellness program initiative is consistent with the motion's goal of health, having healthy food options at city facilities. Um, they're here in committee and can discuss in a little bit more detail on that if you'd like. Um, on October 24th of 2012, um, there was an executive directive number 24 to direct all city departments with food <coughs> purchases of, of greater than $10,000 through their department budgets and contracts to adopt the good food purchasing pledge to have food that is healthy, locally produced, sustainably grown, um, that treat their, for, their workers with respect and use humane methods. The council adopted this policy on October 24th as well, mm -hmm. 2012. Um, this motion is more specific to food options at city facilities for city employees, but we will look at the impact that this policy has as we prepare the report. With regard to vending machines, uh, we do not have any specific information at this time, but we will work with the affected departments to gain more information on that as we prepare the report. Mm -hmm. It's something so simple, yet so um, could affect all of us. So what's the next steps going on from here? We wait for a comprehensive report back? <clears throat> right. We will continue to work with the departments to prepare the, the report on this item. Okay, great. And, you know, I just want to add that um, uh, my office did some research, and over the years there seems to be some related motions that have been introduced, um, but it, it was never uh, followed through on. If the city staff could look at the <coughs> following council files, my staff could provide you with the list, but it's in short, it's 11 1678, 11 1678-S1, 13-0002-S136, 11-1867, and 03-2564. So if we could try to put them all together. Thank you, Councilman. We will look at those council files as we prepare the report. Great. Any questions? Great. Uh, we'll move on consent. I mean, we'll um, pass unanimously on that. And then number two, Mr. Zilla. Item number two is a presentation by the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health, Office of Women's Health, relative to a, the publication titled Health Indicators for Women in Los Angeles County, Highlighting Disparities <coughs> by Ethnicity and Poverty Level 2017. This publication provides a current and comprehensive snapshot of women's health in Los Angeles County using a variety of health indicators. Thank you. And uh, earlier this year, the County Department of Public Health, the Office of Women's Health, released uh, their 2017 edition of the Health Indicators for Women in L.A. County. And, um, and I wanted them to have, uh, have them come here to committee today to present their findings and any ideas for, for, of what they have on how the city can improve our health outcomes for women in the city of Los Angeles. So we have a presentation by uh, Ellen Edom, uh, Rita Sigal, Sigal, uh, Joshua Bobrowski, uh, all from the LA County Department of Public Health, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, yes, thank you. I'm Ellen Item, the Director of the Office of Women's Health. We are part of the Department of Public Health. Um, so, just a two second version about who we are, which is that um, our goal is to try to improve the health status of women overall. And we try to protect, preserve, and advance women's health in a variety of different ways. And part of what we try to do is look at the health inequities and look through, looking at it through a gender lens. And so what we try to do is work at the individual level, the community level, the policy level, and the systems level. And some of the broad issues that we work with, and we overlap with the city significantly, is that both on the health and mental health end, is that we're working together on healthy aging. We work very closely with your city manager, um, Laura Trejo, for the uh, Department of Aging, or the uh, City Department of Aging. Who was formerly with the county. Say it again. Who was formerly with the county. Yes, she was. <laughs> so we work closely. We work closely on the violence against women efforts, on access to care, lesbian and bisexual women's health, women's cancers, um, vision zero, homelessness. So there's a great deal of overlap. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk to you about the importance of data and how to use that data um, in terms of looking at it. And as you, you have in front of you, you have the fourth edition of our um, Women's Health Data Report. And what we do is that we ask people to take a look at this, whether they're um, the community CBOs or whether it's a funder or a legislator or a key stakeholder to say, how do we really use the data for prioritization, programmatic um, implementation or policies. 
And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Rita Single, who will walk you through some of the key findings in the data. Good morning. So yes, thank you for inviting us um, to be here to talk about the findings from this report. So as Ellen um, mentioned, this is the fourth edition of this report, which is produced by the Department of Public Health. It's the report that um, solely focuses on the health of women in Los Angeles County. Um, and what it does is essentially it provides um, data on about 100 standardized health indicators for women in key domains of health. We look at the data by race, ethnicity, and federal poverty level um, with the hope that we're identifying disparities, differences in health that are occurring, um, where we can then uh, produce policies and programs that will impact those disparities and improve the health of women. Now, in each edition of the report, the one thing that does vary are these special health topic pages that are at the end of the report. What we try and do there is we focus on either populations or health issues that are not covered in the rest of the report to really kind of highlight those. So I am going to be talking about some of the data from those sections as well today, which includes topics such as homeless women, economic security and well-being for women, American Indian and Alaska Native women. So just a quick note on where does this data come from. So this data is not collected by our office, but it comes from local, for the most part, um, state and national data sources um, that include population-based surveys. So these are surveys that are conducted over the phone with a certain sample of um, uh, community representatives, or it can come from state um, registries, um, birth, death records, um, hospital, ER, emergency, emergency visit and discharge data. So there's a variety of different sources that we get the data from, and then we compile it together through these indicators. So I'm going to go ahead and begin with some of the key findings. I'm going to just touch on a few things for each domain of health as we, just, as we describe it in the report. So beginning with um, the demographics, here it's just to kind of give a snapshot of when we're looking at the women in Los Angeles County, who, who are we talking about? So I should clarify this report is for adult women, so it's 18 years of age and older. So we have approximately 3.5 million adult women in Los Angeles County. When you look at the chart here, it breaks down um, the women by race ethnicity. And so we have about 70% of women being women of color, with 46% being Latina, 14% Asian, 9% black, and then smaller percentages of American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiian, other Pacific Islander. Quick question, adult woman, is that um, a particular age bracket? It's not seniors, or? It, it's 18 all the way up. 18 all the way up? Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah, so yes, it's true, when you look at adult you know, it can then be broken up further. So just for the purposes of this report, we're talking about adult versus those younger than 18. Yeah. And then um, the remaining 30% are white women. So of all the women in the county, about 46% of them are foreign born. And when we break this down and look at it by race ethnicity, it's about 76% of Asian women that are foreign born and 64% of Latinas. What we do notice is that for Asian women, they actually have been here for fewer years compared to Latinas who tend to have been here for 10 years or longer. Um, now, overall, 37% of women speak a language other than English at home, so we know the diversity that we have. Over 100 different languages are spoken in the county. And then when we looked at household type, one important thing to remember is that we have about 17% of women that are single adults with children in the household, compared to men where it's less than 10%. So this is just an, um, an added issue that we need to consider when we're looking at health of women. Here we have a chart that's looking at women in Los Angeles County by age and race ethnicity. And so here, what, what I, the main point I want to make is that how is the population changing over the next few decades? So right now, when we look at women in LA County in the first column, about 40% of them are 18 to 39 years of age. Another 40% are 40 to 64 years of age, and we have about 17% that are 65 years of age and older. When we look at it by race ethnicity, you can see actually for white women, we have a much larger percent that are 65 years of age and older at 30% compared to, for example, the Latina population where um, half of them are actually younger than 40. And then when we look at this and we look at projections going forward in the next few decades, what we're finding is that the percentage of um, that are going to be 65 years of age and older, this is for both men and women, it's going to double over the next few decades. So we're going to have a much larger population that are um, older adults. And then in addition to that, we're going to start seeing changes where the diversity is going to increase among those older adults. So as we see these other um, race ethnic groups aging, we're going to have a very different population 20, 30 years from now that we're going to be um, looking at. Okay, so now to move into the determinants of health. So determinants of health are essentially those um, upstream factors that are influencing health that are, um, you know, 
uh, very important for us to be addressing, but very difficult to, to do. So first, let's look at education level among women. So in this chart, what we should look at is women by education level, starting with less than high school over on the left. So about one in four women in Los Angeles County have a less than high school education. This is compared to about 20% of men, or one in five. Now on the other end of the spectrum, we have another about 25%, so a quarter of them, that have a college degree or postgraduate degree, and this is compared to 30% of men. So essentially we do have an education gap that we see when it comes to men and women in the county. Now how does this relate? So half of women that live in poverty have less than a high school education, so very linked to how much you're going to make um, your education. <coughs> We also see a big disparity by race ethnicity. So Latinas, 45% of them have a less than high school education compared to about 10% for Asian and black women and only um, 4 to 5% for white women. And then we look at poverty, right? So a key determinant of health. So here we're looking at the percent of women who are living below 200% of the federal poverty level. And the way that we define that is at 100%, that's approximately $23,000 as an annual income for a family of four, two adults and two children. And that was the year of when this data was, so in 2015, that's where this data comes from. So at 200% of the federal poverty level, poverty level, it's double that, so it's about $47,000 per um, a year. And so what we see here is that over half of women in Los Angeles County are living at less than 200% of the federal poverty level, but even more startling is that one in four of them are actually living in poverty. Um, when you look at it by race ethnicity, so again, dramatic differences. We have 70% of Latinas, 60% of black women, around 46% of Asian women living at less than 200% of the federal poverty level compared to about 24% of white women. Now, poverty is directly related to other determinants of health and health outcomes. So this is a bit of a busy slide, but essentially the shades of blue indicate um, increasing um, annual incomes. So those in the lightest blue are those that are living in poverty. And what we see is that poverty is directly linked to higher food insecurity and also women reporting living in unsafe neighborhoods. And we also see on the health outcome side that low-income women have higher prevalence of obesity and diabetes than women living at higher incomes. Okay, so let's move into a little bit about health status. So with health status, we define this as with two main indicators. The first one is looking at life expectancy. So here in this chart, we're showing the average life expectancy at birth among females in Los Angeles County by race ethnicity. And we're looking at a trend over the last 10 years. So what's really, so a lot of interesting things that we find on this chart. So first off, you can see that by race ethnicity, there are huge differences. So we have Asian Pacific Islander women that actually have the highest life expectancy compared to black women. And what is important here to notice is that there's about a 10-year differential, and that has maintained all throughout. So even when you look at the 2004 data over on the left, um, life expectancy was 10 years more for Asian women at that time, and even now in 2013, although we've seen a steady increase in life expectancy for all groups, you're still seeing that 10-year differential. So although we're improving the health of women and they're living longer, we're still seeing huge disparities. Here we have um, what we term a self-reported health status. So this is based on a question that we ask the women, um, how would you rate your health? And it's on a simple five-point scale, you know, excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor. And what we're looking at here are the lower two categories. So what percentage of them report having only a fair or poor health status? And we look at the data by race ethnicity as well. So overall, about 22% of women are reporting a fair or poor health status, but you have a far higher percent when we look at Latinas at 28%. And the data that's not shown on the slide, when we're looking at poverty linked to health status, those living in poverty, about 37% of them are reporting um, poor health. So it all kind of intersects back with poverty and race ethnicity. Okay, so moving into healthcare coverage and access. So this is actually one of the most, um, uh, one of the areas that we actually had the most gains. So one really positive effect that we saw for women. So as you know, Affordable Care Act, Obamacare and Medi-Cal expansion, um, were implemented over the last few years, and we were very interested in looking at what impact did that have for health insurance coverage for women in the county. So here what we did <coughs> is we looked at data from 2011 and compared it to 2015, which was the latest data that we had. And what we found here is that overall about 26% of women in Los Angeles County ha were uninsured back in 2011, which was the peak. So it had been going up slowly. That's the highest it had ever been in the last decade. And then um, what happened in 2015 is it had decreased um, by more than half, and only 10% of women were now uninsured, so dramatic. We've never seen numbers like that. 
um, by race ethnicity, again, you know, we see 40% of Latinos were uninsured, and that dropped um, to 14%, which was the largest decrease that you can see here. Um, and so the disparities are still there where, you know, Latinas still are the most likely to have um, no insurance, but the numbers, we've made a huge impact. This, we've never seen numbers like this before. Um, or change in numbers like this. So what actually was the cause of this huge group of women now gaining insurance? So we looked at those that are covered by Medi-Cal. So that's what this next um, slide is. So here we show that about 20% of women were covered by Medi-Cal in 2011, and this increased to 36%, so almost doubled with Medi-Cal expansion. And now we have almost over half of black women being covered by Medi-Cal, um, close to half for Latinas, but it affected all populations across the board. So really it was the Medi-Cal expansion that really had the impact on health insurance coverage for women in the county. Okay, so moving into health behaviors, we're looking at two specific behaviors. One, it, it involves nutrition, so it's soda consumption or drinking at least one soda or sweetened drink a day. And the second indicator is looking at physical activity. So those that have no weekly aerobic activity. Um, yeah, per week. So um, this is based, this is looking at data based on education level. And what you can see is that there's again a clear um, link here that those that have a lower education level are more likely to have, um, drink soda and are less likely to get any weekly aerobic activity. We also look at those same indicators by federal poverty level. And again, we see the same trend where those that are um, uh, having a lower income are more likely to uh, drink soda and to uh, not get enough uh, physical activity. Now, what's important to remember here is when we look at these health behaviors, you know, we used to really focus on the individual. So we need to go in and we need to talk to that individual. We need to tell them that they need to stop drinking sodas and they need to go and get exercise. What we know now is that it's really linked to your social and, um, and physical environment. So those that are low income, those that are less educated, they have less time, they don't have the facilities, they don't have the wherewithal to be able to do this. They're living in neighborhoods that don't allow for safe activity, physical activity, and they don't have good food options for them. So that's really what's impacting the health behavior that we're seeing that lead to poor health outcomes. And finally, we're going to move into health conditions or the actual health outcomes, the, the actual diseases that we're seeing. So here again, I thought it was important to show this chart from our data report, um, which looks at the percent of women with obesity in Los Angeles County. And this is, again, by race ethnicity. So again, some key findings that you see here is that overall, obesity has been increasing, um, especially in black and Latino women, which are the um, groups that have the highest rates of obesity. This is going back to 1997 all the way through 2015. Um, there are differences, so vast differences, the disparities that you see between the different groups. Now, one perhaps positive thing that we're starting to see is when you look at the 2011 and 2015 data, you actually see for the first time some leveling off. And so this could potentially be some very good news in our fight against the obesity epidemic that we're finally seeing some change here. We won't know until we get another year of data to really see whether the trend is real or not. So that's something that we're keeping a close eye on, but that could be potential very good news for us. The differences, of course, are still there, so we still need to target these groups as being much higher, um, having much higher rates of obesity uh, versus the others. Here we're looking at um, the causes of death, so the leading causes of death, the top 10 for women, and then the leading causes of premature death. So premature death is um, identified as death occurring before age 75, so if there's, um, these are the conditions that are most likely to cause early death um, in women. So overall, what you see is that there's a lot of chronic <coughs> disease on this table, so a lot of heart disease, stroke, um, lung disease, cancers, but I wanted to point out two important things here. So first, in leading causes of death, we now have Alzheimer's disease at number three. So we've never seen Alzheimer's disease this high up on the list. Um, disease rate, mortality rates from, morta from Alzheimer's disease have doubled over the last about 15 years, and so that's definitely something that we're going to be um, looking at uh, further. For premature death, what we now see at number four, which was never that high up, is unintentional drug overdose. And so again, this I think goes to a lot of what we know currently, um, where there's um, some, a, a lot of things happening with the opioid epidemic that could be influencing this uh, moving up on the list. Um, so this is just some selected leading causes of death. I just wanted to show some trends on this because people are always interested, like for example, with diabetes mortality, we are seeing a decline in diabetes mortality with breast cancer as well, although maybe not as steep. And then here in the green line is the Alzheimer's disease that we talked about that is really just um, increasing uh, tremendously. So now I'm gonna move into some of the special health topic pages that we um, 
uh, had in the report. So the first one is the economic security and well-being. And here we looked at uh, specific economic and employment data for um, women in the county, and we compared it to women nationally, women in California, and then men in Los Angeles County. So in this first chart, I'm showing the median annual earnings of women and men in Los Angeles County by race ethnicity. So overall, you see in LA County, um, women make uh, approximately $40,000 a year compared to about 42,000 for men. So what we call the wage gap is that women are making about 95% of what men are. That's actually not that bad compared to what we see nationally and at the state level where it's more of an 80% to 85% gap. And that's because um, the annual median earnings for men actually tend to be closer to 50,000 at the state and national level, um, whereas women are still around $40,000 as well. Now, you do have some important findings when you look at data by race ethnicity. So you can see for Latinos, for both men and women, they have the lowest annual median, median earnings, and white men have the highest. And so we use the white men as the benchmark, and we compare the other groups to them. So essentially, um, Latinas are making 38% of white men, followed by black women at 58%, Asian women at 67%, and white women at 80%. Okay, so a huge gap there are differences. So when we look at where's um, income going for women, so there's two main places, right? There's cost of childcare and there's cost of housing. And so here we're looking at what impact does the cost of housing have um, for these women. So this is single female householders that are renting. And what percent of them are spending more than 30% of their gross income on rent, which is really the cutoff that we use to look at um, what should be considered um, uh, norm for, for women, for people to spend on rent. And so here we see it's a vast, vast number. So we have 70% of women spending over 30% of their income on rent. And so it's higher than what we see nationally. And when we look at it by race ethnicity, you see higher rates among Latinas and black women having to spend that much income on rent compared to white women and Asian women. Okay, so a lot more in the report on this, but I'm just going to be touching on small things. So, um, so now moving into homelessness. So we know homelessness is a huge public health issue, um, something that we've been uh, really looking at closely uh, for the last couple of years. And so what we did was we went to the um, Los Angeles Housing Services Authority and we went to their homeless count data and we asked to look at the data specifically for women. So we wanted to know more about the homeless women. And so here we have kind of the trends, so the number of homeless women and how it's changing over time. And so we see that there's actually um, the homeless, the number of homeless women increased by 55% from 2013. Um, to 2016, so that's what we've all heard, that the numbers are going up. Um, and then when we look at this, this 14,000 homeless women, about 70% of them are what we term as unsheltered, where they're living in a place that is not meant for human habitation. So majority of them are out on the streets, okay, versus shelters. Again, when you look at this same population, 40% of them are black, 29% Latina, and 23% white, so they make up the majority of um, the the race ethnic breakdown. And then one other thing I wanted to point out is that when, for the majority of homeless um, women, they are single adults, but for women, we have more homeless women that are living in families with children than homeless men. So again, it adds a whole complexity to what um, their issues are when they're out on the streets. So here we look at some selected health and social characteristics of homeless women. And so this is, we're looking at it by sheltered status. So in the blue, we have those that are unsheltered, and in orange are those that are sheltered. And so we can see that those that are out on the streets, they have much higher rates of having mental illness, having experienced domestic violence, substance abuse, and being physically disabled. So a lot of barriers for them to really get into care and to get into housing um, that's impacting them. One thing I wanted to point out just specifically with the domestic violence, we still have one in five women that are in shelters that have experienced domestic violence. And when we look at this data in certain pockets of LA, so for example, when we look at data from the Downtown Women's Center, um, they, had, they reported much higher rates of uh, domestic violence among their homeless women. So again, this is broadly for LA County, but when we're looking at pockets within the Valley, pockets in other places, the data is gonna be a little bit different. Okay, so next, um, we, uh, for the first time in this report, we were able to get some data looking at trauma, violence, stress, and discrimination, which we know are some key, key determinants of health when it comes to health. It, Im it impacts them, but we've never really been able to look at these factors before. We didn't have the data to look at them, so we're very excited to share this data and to see, you know, what does it really mean and how is it impacting health. 
So on this first slide here, we have the percent of women who report ever experiencing physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner. So essentially intimate partner violence um, in Los Angeles County. So overall, we had about 17% of women reporting intimate partner violence. When we look at it by race ethnicity, we had higher rates among black women and white women. One thing to caution here, there may be cultural differences in how the question was asked and answered. So we're, um, you know, we want to look at this further because we're not convinced that for Latinas and Asian women it's really going to be that, that different or that much lower. What is interesting is when we look at the data by federal poverty level, so you know that for all the other data that I've shown here, pretty much poverty is always impacting the health indicator in some way. So here you can see that actually no matter what income you are, women across the board are being impacted by intimate partner violence at the same rate. So here we're getting into some interesting data where we're looking, this, is, this was a survey that was done among women who had just had a baby, and we asked them whether they had a stressful event during their pregnancy, which is shown in the blue, and we also asked them if they'd ever experienced discrimination over their lifetime, and that's what's shown in the, in the yellow. And so what we found was that overall among women in LA County who had just had a baby, 64% of them reported having a stressful event during their pregnancy. And a stressful event was described as um, whether they went through a uh, divorce or separation, someone close to them had died, um, their partner went to jail or they had to go to jail, if they had difficulty paying bills, so it was a variety of different stressors that we looked at. Now overall, when we look at race ethnicity, it was a much higher percent among black women that reported having a stressful event. Um, followed by Latinas, white women, and then Asian women. For the discrimination indicator, this was very interesting. Again, the first time that we had data on this. So overall, about 38% of women um, in the county said that they experienced discrimination at least once over their lifetime. It was higher among black women. In the report, we actually go into a, a more detail looking at under what circumstances they report the discrimination and for what reasons. So just to say here briefly, the most common reported circumstance was that they were facing discrimination at work. And um, the most common reason reported was that they were fa facing discrimination because of their race or color. Okay, so important inf information that we're just starting to look at now. <clears throat> okay, last, um, I wanted to talk about the American Indian Alaska Native population. So as you know, the data report looks at data by race ethnicity, but we're not able to include data on smaller communities where the data numbers are so small that it doesn't give us an, um, valid data to show. So in order to look at this community that we haven't been able to include in the report in the past, we did a special analysis where we um, pooled data from several survey years together to get high enough numbers to be able to look at some data for them. So in this first slide, we're looking at the percent of women that are reporting a disability or reporting fair or poor health status. And in the first column here is where we have the American Indian and Alaska Native. So here we have 73% um, of American Indian and Alaska Native women reporting a disability, which is far higher than any of the other race ethnic groups. So we were very startled by this data to the point that we went back and double checked it and triple checked it and actually showed it to some of our experts as well. What's um, considered a disability? So a disability, we have a definition <coughs> in the report and essentially it's basically um, Self-reported self -reported where it's defined as a positive response to either their activity being limited because of a physical, mental, or emotional problem, or a health problem that requires the use of special equipment, or if they have a self-perception of being disabled. So it's a pretty broad definition, but I think when you look at the data and compare it to other groups, it, it would be hard to say that it, that question was necessarily being misinterpreted for this community versus the others that would account for this disparity. So I think the actual disability rates are higher for this group. And then when you look at the percent that are reporting fair or poor health status, again, we had looked at this data earlier in the presentation. It was Latinas who had the highest rate, but here now you can see that actually American Indian Alaska Native um, had even higher rates of reporting poor health. And then here we're looking at some outcomes, so overweight and obesity and high blood pressure. And so again, we, you know, traditionally we've thought of black women and Latinas having the higher, highest rates of obesity and overweight, but we saw even higher rates among um, American Indian and Alaska Native, and then the same thing with high blood pressure, where traditionally we've always thought of black women having the highest rates, but here we saw um, half of American Indian and Alaska Native women reporting high blood pressure as well. And data not shown on this slide, but in the report we have mortality rates or death rates, um, that again, higher rates among American Indian and Alaska Native for coronary heart disease, diabetes, compared to other race ethnic groups. And so, you know, we've, we've done some further look at this and we've engaged some of our community members that um, work with this community and are from the community. And so we're learning, of course, they have, there's a lot of historical context for what is going to be contributing to poor health for this community. And so we could, um, hope to continue to work with them and look at how we can start reversing some of these um, uh, disparities and trends that we're seeing. 
So in conclusion, um, we have a very diverse population um, in Los Angeles County, and they have very unique health needs. We're projecting that they're going to age and they're going to become more diverse, so we have to really look at how that's going to impact what health needs that they're going to have, what services that they're going to need. There has been some evidence of gains that were made in health, so the health insurance coverage was the, you know, the best story out of this. Um, we also are seeing perhaps a leveling off of obesity, and we are continuing to see declines in mortality rates or death rates from leading causes of, um, of death, such as coronary heart disease and stroke. However, the health inequities are still there. We're still seeing huge differences in uh, life expectancy between different race ethnic groups. We're seeing a huge impact of poverty, education, um, on uh, different health indicators. And, more, and what we're really wanting to now look at some of these deep-rooted determinants of health, such as trauma, discrimination, uh, racial bias, and how they're impacting health for these communities. So looking to the future, I'm actually going to pass, the, pass it over to my colleagues here to talk a little bit about well, what do we need to do about some of this data that we're seeing. And really, we're focusing, as Ellen mentioned, on protecting, preserving, and advancing women's health. So I'm going to actually hand it over to them to talk about some of this. Thank Great. you. Thank you. And I would say that you know, two of the critical areas for us are looking at protecting, preserving, and advancing women's health in the current environment and protecting the most vulnerable. And there are a number of um, you know, key priority areas for the County Department of Public Health, um, as well as for all of us that the, the report is highlighting, but some areas such as affordable housing, environmental justice and equity, poverty issues, um, infant mortality and the disparities and equities there, um, climate change, reproductive health, discrimination and experiences with stress and racism. Um, obviously, these are all sort of impacted at the change in administration at the federal <coughs> level, but as well also as, you know, on the policies that we're enacting at the state and local level, um, be it, you know, wage policies and whatnot. Um, we're also looking at, obviously, preserving the health care access gains made through the ACA and Medi-Cal expansion. <coughs> um, the county board uh, adopted a motion in support of the ACA and trying to maximize the health insurance gains um, that we've seen. I mean, I think you saw the data that the huge drop in uninsurance rates um, from 20 percent and over and looking at the disparities among um, racial and ethnic groups uh, within that. Um, with certainly higher rates and dropping to uh, the data. This data goes as far as 2015, but what we're hearing at the national level um, projections for LA County, the estimates of an insurance dropped to even below 10%. So again, historically low levels as a result of um, improvements uh, from the ACA and largely as a result of Medi-Cal expansion in, in California. Um, so those are some key issues. And, and finally, advancing our understanding of factors contributing to women's health inequity. So, you know, continuing this very <coughs> important work, and I think looking to the city to work with us on, you know, suggesting additional areas or data that we can use um, in trying to highlight these issues. So with that, I think I will conclude and see what kind of questions you have. Thank you so very much. This is a very fascinating report. And you know, I was thinking maybe next year, I'd love to have you come back again, but next year, <clears throat> um, we also had UCLA. Um, they presented to us last year the quality of life survey that, that, that former LA County Supervisor Zev Yaroslavsky has done. Um, and he's going to be presenting to our committee next committee, uh, possibly a joint with uh, homelessness and poverty. But uh, his survey pretty much mirrors a lot of things that you stated. Like, for example, on page 8 and page 24, page 8 being the uh, homelessness and food insecurity and page 24 being the rent. Um, shockingly, last year as well as this year, um, their s survey found that the number one concern, I mean, usually it's public safety, but... Uh, and public safety was high up there, but the number one concern was um, fear of being homeless. And, and, the shock, and the bigger shocking thing was the income level. Uh, the, it, it was pretty much across all levels, including um, the number one concern, uh, and I think the bracket was something like eighty dollars to $120,000 a year, which we consider moderate to high income, and um, especially in our high, and, and, your, and your chart shows 70% of the lower income using their, um, um, their income for rent. And even if you're making 120000 you could easily be using 50% plus on rent, depending on where you live. So, I mean, uh, maybe we could have them come together next year so you guys could, uh, so we could get both of the presentations. Um, <clears throat> you know, I have a, in your full report, how big is your full report? 
So the full report itself is about 28 pages long. Oh, it's this? Yeah, this is yeah, the full okay. report. Yeah. You know, what, what would be great is, because um, like some of them, some of them you have a comparison to previous years, some of them you have a comparison yes. to men, but if you could always have a comparison to especially, I don't know, whether it's men or a time period, so we could see the trends. In some of the charts, you did do that. Yeah. So so it's always just a matter of space, but we've gotten a lot of feedback in that, you know, we compare it to both men and women, but to actually have a separate men column so that mm -hmm. you can yeah, at see the difference between women and men right. for all of the indicators. Right. So that's definitely something that's already on my list for the next Great. version. Or, or a time frame, right? Yes, so. yes, yes. And um, I just had a couple of questions. Um, the Alzheimer's one on page 21. Yes. There was an increase in Alzheimer's. Is that because there's just an increase in aging population, or is it proportional still, so it's just a higher increase? So that is death um, rates, and so it's a rate based on, um, you know, it's supposed to be corrected for age, so right. it's not supposed to be just an aging population. Some of the things that we're thinking about as to why that may have happened is what we, what we do know is that over the last couple of decades, we've gotten much better at knowing that Alzheimer's disease is the cause of death. Oh. So that's based on what's reported on your death record. And so it wasn't as common <coughs> before where it may be that if the person died and they had Alzheimer's but they died of something that, you know, slightly different, they would have put that down as the primary cause of death. But now they know it was actually the Alzheimer's that did it. So I think part of it is reporting. But part of it is that I think there is a real trend, and we're still trying to understand what it is that's contributing to that trend of uh, the increase in Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. But it wouldn't be just the age or the, the yeah. aging population. Okay. Well, on page 13, um, uh, that's shocking. I've never saw it like this. Um, Obamacare, how we went from 26% mm -hmm. of all women in LA Cap. For Latinas, it's even more drastic. Yes, yes. But, you know, hopefully you'll be tracking it carefully. <clears throat> I mean, I, uh, I'm, I'm confident, and I know our representatives in D.C. are going to fight uh, um, vigorously, and so will we down in locally for the ACA, for the Affordable Care Act. But if it does, if, if it gets cut back or decimated somehow, it will be good to see the, the trend. Yes, absolutely. So we, the, that data comes from the L.A. County Health Survey, which is a Department of Public Health survey that's done every two to three years. So it's mm -hmm. going to actually be out in the field. Um, later this year and early next year. So let's see what happens on in that arena and whether we're able to capture that. And I think the biggest piece there is that we want to protect Medi-Cal. That's mm -hmm. the main thing because that's what caused yeah. that decrease. So yeah. I, I would also note that the county or the public health department is soon going to be putting out uh, a brief on the uh, health insurance trends overall um, for the population looking at um, trends from the health survey. So it helps establish a baseline that we can look uh, for changes in health care uh, yeah. insurance rates yeah. as time goes on, depending on yeah. you know, what the environment is. Yeah, and DV, I mean, uh, that's, just, I mean, I, I knew the three uh, most vulnerable populations for at risk of being homeless is domestic violence victims, foster, foster youth, and seniors, but wow, it's just, it's, to be up there with mental illness, I mean, that's just mm -hmm. tremendous. Um, and we know that it's extremely underreported, so right, it's that too. even more extreme, yeah. And I bet if you did it, if you did a cross-section by ethnicity, uh, the monolinguals will be even, uh, even a higher yeah. peak. Um, so this is a, this is a, I mean, I think uh, I could probably answer this question, but I just want to make sure, you know, in what geographic areas of the county as well as the city of Los Angeles do women experience the greatest number of um, health issues? Is there some sort of... So um, I figured, you know, we're talking to this, about the city here, whereas our data is county. So we do have another um, report that comes out, which I think mm. I have a copy of it here, where it looks at data by spa or service planning areas. Mm -hmm. so it gets a little bit down. It's hard for us to get down to the mm. city, you know, the district level, because then the numbers become too small. So they actually have the same indicators that we have in this report, very, very similar to it. And they show the data by service planning areas. So I think okay. um, it'd be hard to answer your question. I think, you know, generally it's going to be spa six. Right. Um, that's going to have, you know, the, the poorest outcomes. But we do see a lot of variation. So, for example, with SPA 1, mm -hmm. you know, they're gonna, they have issues as well. You know, the Valley, they've got their own specific, oh. you know, there's certain things related to air and all of that that's going to be higher. Their infant mortality is much higher up there versus, um, you know, down in SPA mm -hmm. 6. But we can get a copy of that report for you. I can leave it for, I have a yeah. copy. I yeah, that would be great if we could yeah. get a copy. And it's probably just by zip codes, right? I mean, it's, it's, um, is, it re is it most re relatable to um, income levels? So the way that they do the data is they take the zip code of the person responding to the survey and they then aggregate the zip codes by, at the service planning area level. Mm. And then they show the data at that level. They do not necessarily break down the data by poverty, but they'll have poverty overall broken mm -hmm. down by spa. So you do you guys work that. with the California Endowment because they have that mm -hmm. amazing and pretty much equates everything in zip codes? 
Yes, yeah. absolutely. So we have a few different places where we can get the zip code piece. And then, you know, even with the California Health Interview Survey coming out of UCLA, they now have what's called the neighborhood edition. So they can, you can actually get down at the zip, so zip code level for some of their data indicators as well. So if there's something specific you're interested in, we can, we're happy to look that up. Great. And, and my last question, I know you mentioned earlier that you already um, uh, interface and collaborate with the city. Um, but, it, like, in, do you guys do seminars together? I mean, what actual... We just literally last week had a gigantic event on healthy aging. It was okay. our, the 11th in a series that we did, and we do it together. So Laura is our representative. We have a steering committee. We mm -hmm. work very closely, the county, the city, Department of Mental Health, Department of Public Health, et cetera, and other community-based organizations, mm -hmm. very large, very successful, looking at kind of intergenerational issues. And we do, so we do an event we have a, we've formed a committee together called the Los Angeles Alliance for Community Health and Aging. And this is something that we work on to be able to expand what we call evidence-based health promotion programs throughout the county. And right now they're most prominent within the city of Los Angeles. So we also work in, in, in violence issues. We work both city and county work together. Um, we definitely could do more, absolutely. But I think we have a pretty vibrant interconnection. Great. Great. Well, you know, a, a big piece of my heart is with the county. I, I used to oversee the public health department when it was its own department. But um, thank you for your presentation. I don't know if you have any questions. I can. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And definitely your experience and knowledge in your prior life prior to arriving here has really helped us shape policy as it relates to health and education. And really commend you, um, David, for taking on this leadership role. And thank you for your report. Uh, I do know um, there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And I have a couple questions. One, um, in light of doing everything we can on the count city and state level of raising the wage to 15, how much of an impact would that be? Do you anticipate in the poverty levels that facing women in our area? And two, um, the homeless women figures are quite alarming. So with the recent passage of both H and HHH, um, do you feel the both passage of both measures will have a significant impact in addressing um, homelessness, um, women in, in, that are facing homelessness in our county? Yeah, so I, I know definitely with the um, increasing the minimum wage, a huge impact. So when we're looking at how do we address the wage gap, that is one of the primary ways that mm -hmm. we, would, we would address that. So just by having a lower, a, a higher threshold at the bottom of what people are going to earn, it's going to make a big impact. And there's, we have a lot of women that are those lowest wage earners. So just helping prop them up by giving them more, that's definitely going to have, should have a huge impact. And so that's something we're going to, we'll look out for and see if we can, you know, actually determine through the data what impact it had. Um, I think with the housing, I mean, I'm... And the department recently put out a health impact assessment analysis of okay. Measure JJJ, which talks about, you know, the Good. anticipated impacts as well. We also just put out one on um, the Measure H for the homelessness mm -hmm. services uh, for the county. So that, again... JJJ or HHH? You mean HHH, right? Uh, JJJ on the affordable housing on the affordable one, housing and recently did one on the county's measure of age, if I'm getting the letter right. And lastly, if I can, Mr. Chair, it's, it's hopeful, I mean, to see the, the progress being made on a women, women's health over the last few years. Um, but with the potential changes coming from D.C., what uh, steps is the county um, department of public health taking and to safeguard its constituencies, specifically our women, um, on what to come next uh, in, in light of, you know, cuts to family planning and the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. uh, I, think the, uh, I think the board has been very strong in its support both, again, of the ACA, um, which has not just um, expansion of health insurance, but also has mm -hmm. the first dedicated funding stream for public health activities, which included um, over the last since 2011, 40 million in grants to LA County for a number of um, uh, grant funding streams, including chronic disease, you know, prevention, uh, and the board has, you know, expressed support for that as well. Okay. Um, and likewise on um, reproductive health, uh, the board has expressed, you know, strong support. Okay. I think also, so both on the ACA, take, saying that you know that they'll do everything to protect sort of the advances. The other was on immigrant rights. 
Um, and then also they ha there's, um, which I'm sure um, I know your member participated with the Women and Girls Initiative, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. has, um, uh, I think will have a giant impact over the next five years to really look at what does it mean to be able to look um, as an umbrella on everything from poverty to all the health uh, inequities, you know, to, to say what does it look like for women and girls. So I think that's a big, a big step and a big commitment as well as um, what Josh was saying about taking a, an active step on supporting Planned Parenthood and reproductive health. I would also note on the immigrant services that the board um, created the Office of Immigrant Services within the county. Um, I think anecdotally we're hearing a lot of evidence that um, people are hesitant to go in for, you know, all kinds of services, but particularly uh, health care as well. So that's a, a concern for us. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the comprehensive report. And I, I, I agree that we should look at this in committee um, on an annual by yeah. annual basis. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you appreciate much. it. So uh, public comment was fulfilled. I mean, uh, comment for this item was fulfilled. So uh, we'll pass, uh, we'll receive and file. <clears throat> and number three. Number three is Los Angeles <coughs> Department of Aging report relative to a policy for city departments to implement elder abuse reporting training for non-mandated reporters. This matter was continued from the February 23rd, 2016 committee meeting. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Randall. And um, this was first brought to our committee's attention to prove the city's ability to spot and, re and report suspected elder abuse. I know Councilmember Joe uh, uh, Bob Blumenfield, um, um, and it was seconded by Councilmember Buscaino, uh, was very interested and concerned about this. And, and his staff couldn't be here today, but I'm sure you spoke with his office. Um, and um, so, you know, I just actually, um, I read your report, great. I just had a quick question, quick two questions. Sure. Um, first one is I know um, because of privacy issues you can't uh, give us the exact um, referrals, uh, the number of I mean the uh, the trends and the data for the referrals. But can you give a general trend, like just the actual numbers overall? Uh, James Dunn, Department of Aging. Uh, it's not that for confidentiality issues. It's actually we don't have that data because the cases are reported to Adult Protective Services and they won't share the information. In the county? Yes. But um, I mentioned in the earlier report that uh, in 2015, um, our partners, uh, Water and Power and Housing, uh -huh. when they come across seniors who may possibly be uh, victims of elder abuse or at least seniors that seem to be in some sort of distress, that they report them to us. And then our department will follow up with that senior to see if it is an issue that needs to be referred to uh, Adult Protective Services or if it's something that maybe one of our nonprofit senior service agencies can help them with, maybe just with food or transportation or something along those lines. So in 2015, I believe we had about 444 uh, referrals to our department of seniors that were in distress. Um, so far this year, since January, at the beginning of the year, we have about 176 referrals, mainly from Water and Power, uh, and just a handful from Housing. Uh -huh. So it, if we continue at this rate, it does seem like there's a slight increase, uh, but until we can find out you know, how many of them were actually referred to APS this year, I can't make that comparison to see if we're seeing more cases of elder abuse or if it's simply that um, as the economy had gotten worse, there were, was a greater need for senior <clears throat> services. So that's something we, we'll keep an eye on. So it's only GWP and uh, housing? Uh, those are the ones that we had the special partnership. Uh, uh, we call it the SOS program. Uh, basically, we have an arrangement with them that if any of their field staff or inspectors come across a situation, then they would basically email us a uh, notification with all the contact information so that we can follow up on that case. Now, what I'm recommending in this report is that by having more city employees who actually have a more frequent contact as part of their normal um, function, that if at least they're trained, well, I, sh I shouldn't say trained, if they learn how to spot signs of elder abuse and who they can contact, we could greatly increase uh, the number of reports and hopefully reach out and help those seniors. So, um, 
So I know that the uh, initial motion also asks for um, including the other departments, and um, so and I know your re uh, your report uh, talks about uh, increased training or um, yeah. more of an education uh, for our staff to uh, recognize this. So um, after we approve the recommendations in this report, what are the follow-up steps? What are the deliverables? How are we? Well, in terms of uh, notifying the agencies if, if this is adopted, uh, our department will notify all the departments that um, this was adopted and they need to review their programs annually. Mm -hmm. um, Thinking is that at the beginning of the fiscal year when new programs are funded, that would be a good time for them to do that review. And if they are uh, implementing programs or they have programs where there would be frequent interactions, they would contact APS to arrange for uh, training. Or they could contact us and we would help them uh, arrange for the training with APS. But I also want, uh, at this point, just to uh, say, uh, Susan Strick from the City Attorney's Office, uh, when I was here last time, there were a number of questions about the elder abuse uh, prosecution process mm -hmm. and reporting, and I was asked to provide, as the follow report, a flow chart about how that prosecution process would work. And so I have asked the City Attorney to join me today so that she could present that and uh, provide answers to any follow-up questions. Sure. Let, let me, if I may, Susan Stricka with the Los Angeles City Attorney's Office. I am the uh, elder abuse and dependent adult abuse prosecutor, but I also conduct the policy work that the city does on that particular side. So in terms of, if I may address the issue of training, um, APS is only one source of uh, entity that gets reported to. We have many, many other sources that we collect information from. Uh, I think that um, the Department of Aging has mentioned some. Often we get reports from neighbors who will report to police department or their local um, law enforcement. They might report to their council office. Um, those reports are usually then sent either to my office or to LAPD to do what we call a welfare call. We trained, uh, two years ago, uh, we had a grant that we were able to train 100 LAPD officers. Those officers um, ranged from detectives all the way down to patrol officers. In my office, I collect the data on the elder abuse cases. Now remember, I'm doing the misdemeanors within the city of Los Angeles. Um, as to those cases that are either referred to us or directly filed with us, we've seen an increase from that training of close to 40 percent, which is amazing. So training, 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 getting it up front, putting that information out in front has been so helpful to people. What used to be concern, what used to be viewed as maybe an assault is now we can say an assault on an elder. The um, punishment becomes six months to one year, so there's an increase. I also um, indicated on my report that uh, we have a partnership with uh, the Los Angeles County Department, Department of Forensic, and we have a forensic center. The forensic center is an amazing tool, and I invite you all to come and see how it operates. It's a weekly program where we get referrals from all sorts. So you get from the ombudsman program, which um, uh, oversees all of the facilities and all the elder and when I say elder, I'm including dependent adults. The um, elder abuse that goes on there or the potential for elder abuse. Sometimes it's a report and after we look at it, we find it isn't actually elder abuse. It might be self-neglect, which isn't really a crime but may need intervention, right? Um, so those are some of the things. There are already trainings in effect that, are, that can be um, sent either online or done by, there's the Department of um, Weiss and Healthy Aging, which is a Santa Monica program that uh, oversees the uh, ombudsman program. They have a lot of training. I know the Department of Aging has training. I know I yesterday <coughs> went out and did training. Um, we have all kinds of training that are already in effect. We meet with LAPD. We're trying to arrange an online elder abuse training so that um, we can have that implemented so it will be part of uh, their every officer's uh, training program. So the statistic that I always like to share is that from now until 2030, each day 10,000 people become a senior. That means that 
people turn 65, and it's all that baby boomer, boomers that are going to be coming about. So that's a huge increase. And as the previous presenters showed, you, um, we have a huge amount of elders that are now in the poverty level. They're, I always like to say that their pot of gold is finite, and if they are financially abused, that pot of gold is gone, and many of them end up homeless, and especially um, elders who are also victims of DV, of domestic violence. So it's uh, very tragic. We, we don't have the facilities for them. So. <coughs> Thank you. Councilor Buscano, do you have any questions? Okay. <coughs> um, uh, I'd like to, I, I don't know, uh, get a report next year or an annual uh, report on this. Do, I receive and, do we receive and file this? And then, or how do we do this, Mr. Randall? Um, if the committee would like to adopt the recommendations in the report as is, the committee could pr approve the recommendations, but if the committee would like to adopt uh, different recommendations, we could continue the item in committee and then the follow-up report would have those rec the different recommendations. Oh, no, so we'll, take, we'll, we'll approve the recommendations in the report um, and, um, and ask if the department could come back in a year or whether you want to match it up with the fiscal year, however it is, to give us an update. And, 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 and then the following upcoming year, if you could uh, give us the uh, numbers for at least our side, for DWP, um, uh, housing included, if we could include LAPD, it seems like city attorney has a lot of data as well, uh, just so we could uh, um, see uh, the trends. Okay, so, so moved. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, and if all public comment, and has been fulfilled, so uh, meeting adjourned. Thank you.